Good morning and welcome to Glenview Christian Church. We are so glad that you have joined us here online this morning. As you've probably heard due to some current circumstances with COVID-19, we have decided as a church to be online only this Sunday and next Sunday. And for the weeks following that, just be on the lookout at our social media and church emails to see some updates on what's coming soon. But we are thankful that we have this opportunity, this technology, that even in the midst of situations like this where things change even last minute, that we have the ability to still gather together, even in our homes, and worship God together. So we just want to praise God for the blessings of technology and community, even in the midst of times like these. Well, our families were supposed to gather this evening to end an entire year study through the Bible. Back in August, last August, we started in Glenview Kids looking at the book of Genesis back in the beginning. And through the last year, we have gone through book by book through the Bible, and we are finally to the book of Revelation. And tonight was supposed to be a huge celebration to look at the hope that we have in heaven. And while it's sad that we can't be here together and celebrate in person, we still have a lot to celebrate because that promise of heaven, that promise of eternal life with God forever, is still there whether we are here in church in person together or whether we are at home in our pajamas and so i want to challenge you to join us today sometime by reading the book of revelation chapter 21. in this book jesus gave john a vision of what heaven was going to look like and it's amazing it's far beyond anything that we could ever dream of and imagine, and I'm sure the words that he spoke don't even do heaven justice. But I think it's fitting that in times like these, in times where there's fear or uncertainty, or maybe as parents, we have a lot of hard decisions to make. Holding on to the hope that Jesus and God have in store for us really grounds us and gives us that peace that passes all understanding. And there's one more issue, one more challenge I want to issue to everyone. And that's to think of what kind of questions you might have about what's in the future, what heaven might be like. Because we're going to circle back around to some of these questions in the month of September as we take a deeper look at what heaven is going to be like. So kids at home, if you have any questions, I want you to have your parents text those to me or email those to me. And adults, too, if you have any questions or if there's things that you would like to know about what the future holds, send those to us. And over the next month, we'll look through those as we formulate our plans for September. But tonight, we had planned for one of our youth, Kaylee, who just graduated from high school, to lead us in a beautiful solo, I Can Only Imagine. And this is a song that looks at what heaven might be like. So even though we can't be together, we've asked Kaylee to come and sing that song as part of our worship lineup this morning. And we also have some of our other young kids and students that will be leading our worship this morning. And as we turn in just a little bit to one of the parables of Jesus and look at how um, God has given us talents and, and resources to make an investment in the kingdom, I want you just to notice how many people during this time have been able to come together and use the gifts that God has given them to serve him in unique ways. And we just want to thank all of those who have served on the stage behind the scenes over the last several months for their service. And we just praise God um, for putting them here in this place. So we invite everybody at home. We want you to stand up on your feet if you are able and let's worship together this morning.
so glad you're here with us worshiping this morning. I'm sad we can't be together in person, but I'm really thankful that we can gather together online and worship under these circumstances. And we're coming to this time in our service where we just take a few moments to give back to God out of the abundance that he's given to us. 
And so, obviously, we're not here to, to be able to give gifts together in person, but that doesn't mean we can't give this week. And so, there's two ways, basically, that you can give this week at Glenview Christian Church. You can write a check and put it in the mail to us, Glenview Christian Church, 1403 Glenview Drive, Glasgow, Kentucky, 42141. And just mail it to us. We'd really appreciate that. Or you can go on our website, www.glenviewchristian.org. Click on the Give tab. And there you'll fill out a form and you can go directly from your bank account, you can use your debit card, you can set up a one-time gift or set up reoccurring gifts, whatever works best for you. And those are two great ways to give, even though, even through these kind of difficult and uncertain times. And so I just want to personally thank you for your generosity. These last several months have just been crazy, let's be honest about it, but you have continued, church, to be faithful in your giving and support, and we appreciate it, and God appreciates it, and so let's be generous again together today, and let's pray as we receive our offering. Father God, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for all the blessings that you have given to us, and we realize that everything we have comes from your hand, and so right now, we just want to take a moment to give back to you in whatever form we're doing that, whether we're writing a check and put it in the mail, whether we're giving online, whether we're going to drop it off at the church later this week, it, 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 that the method really doesn't, doesn't matter. It's the heart of the giver and it's the gift that, that you are leading them to make, that you're leading us to make. And we just thank you, God, for this opportunity to support you, to support your kingdom through the work of Glenview Christian Church. And we just pray that everything that is given would be used to further your kingdom here in Glasgow and around the world through our mission partners. Thank you, God, so much. And may you use what we give today and do something truly amazing with it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
This summer at GCC, we're taking time to study the parables of Jesus. And it seems like a great time for us to do that. Because right now, things are just so unpredictable. Things are so kind of maybe tense and so stressful and so overwhelming. I mean, given all that's going on in our world and our country today, we've got the ongoing you know, health pandemic that we're dealing with. We've got racial tension. We've got you know, heightened political atmosphere with a presidential election. I mean, it's just like all of these things seem to be coming together at the same time to just make life just a a little bit more crazy, a little bit more unpredictable, a little bit more stressful and overwhelming than maybe it's felt in a very, very long time. And I think with all that we're going through right now in our world, with all that, that we're facing right now in our country, a time like now is the perfect time to come back to something that's familiar. To come back to something that's relatable. To come back to something that's understandable. To come back to something that's simple. Because right now things are just so complex and they're so difficult and they're so challenging and they're so hard. There's something There's something amazing. There's something special about just being simple, relatable, understandable, familiar. And I don't know about you, but in this season of life, I just, I find myself at times just feeling totally and completely overwhelmed. I I find myself just really being drained by the circumstances and the situations and and the messages that are texted or that I'm seeing online or that I'm seeing in the news or I'm seeing on social media. I I I mean, it's just, it's so, so very draining. And we're trying to to deal with that. I'm trying to deal with that. You know what? For me, it sucks the life out of me. I just got to be honest with you. It sucks the life out of me. It drains me completely. And I don't know if that's true for you, but I have a suspicion that for many of you, you are the same way. Right now, that is how you are feeling. That is how I am feeling. That's why now more than ever, we need messages that will revitalize us. We need messages that will encourage us. We will need we need messages that will energize us with some positivity. And I think the parables of Jesus do just that. You know what? Jesus is God. Sometimes we forget that. But he also became a man. He was fully God and fully man. He is fully God and fully man. And because of that, he knows us better than we even know ourselves. Sometimes we forget that. And Jesus knew that we need a teacher who could teach us very complex and difficult things in ways that were easy and simple for us to understand. He knew that. And so that's exactly what he did. Jesus knew that we as people are prone to forget that we will hear something one moment and then totally forget about it the next. He knew that. And so he knew that we needed a teacher who would make things memorable, that would would teach in such a way that, that it would stick in our heads And in our minds, he understood, Jesus understood that that grasping abstract principles and concepts can be difficult for many of us. It can be a struggle. And we need, we need somebody that, that can make those things understandable, that can make those things relatable to us. He knew that, and so he taught He taught that way. He taught using stories, oftentimes, that will stick in our minds forever because stories we can remember. We will forget facts and figures over and over and over again. We'll see a chart five minutes later. We'll forget all about it. But stories, stories have the power to stick in our minds that we can remember them forever. And that's why the master teacher, Jesus, was also a master storyteller. And he used stories to help teach really important spiritual truths in a way that we can more easily understand them, but also so that we would remember them and not forget them. Not just the stories that we remember, but we'd actually remember the truths contained in the stories. 
And so that's why parables are one of Jesus' favorite teaching methods. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And today, we're going to tackle a different parable, a parable that I'm pretty sure is familiar to a lot of you. Although, if it's not, that's okay. I mean, if you're hearing the parable today for the very first time, that's wonderful. You haven't had to hear it before now to understand how important it is and to get the truths that are there for us. It's a story of four men. A story of four men. It's a story of riches. I mean, vast sums of money, vast sums of wealth. It's a story of great success. I mean, people that achieved greatness and also a story of pretty much complete and total failure. Now, typically it's referred to as the parable of the talents or perhaps the parable of the bags of gold. And it's found in Matthew 25, verses 14 to 30. And if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to go ahead, open them up, follow along. But today, I'm going to tell the story like Jesus would have told the story rather than just read it. But I do encourage you to take note of it and follow along. And like I mentioned, this is a story of four men. You have... You know, an obscenely wealthy man. I mean, a man that had riches, probably untold riches. And then he has three servants. Three servants that, that serve him. Three servants that do for him, I guess, whatever it is that he asked them to do for him. And these four men are, are what the story is all about. How did the rich man become so rich, you might wonder? I have no idea. We, we are told the details of his wealth. All we really know about him is he is rich. I mean, really rich. Stinking rich, I would say. He also, we know, likes to travel and travel for weeks or months on end. That's not an issue for him. He has enough money to do that. And so he loves to travel. And we also know that he really places a lot of trust in his servants. A lot of trust he placed in his servants. Now, that's not much to know about a man, but it's something. We actually know even less about his three servants. We basically just know that they're servants. They're, you know, they're on the lower rung of society. They're, they're kind of the step, you know, step below most everybody else. And some of them appear to be hard workers. Well, you could argue that one isn't interested in working at all. And that's really, that's really all we know about these servants. We also do know one other thing. I think this is actually pretty important. We know one other thing about these servants. They all have some gifts and talents and abilities. They all have something to work with. Now, what they do with it might be different, but they all have something to work with. Now, the rich man is preparing to go on one of his trips, and this trip is going to be a long one. How long? He hasn't even decided yet. It's going to be weeks, probably months, maybe even longer than that. And so before he leaves, he gathers his servants together. He gathers his servants before them, probably one at a time, and he gives his most gifted and talented servants five bags of gold. He gives them five bags bags of gold because we know we know that he is the most gifted and talented because we're told that he gives these gifts based on their talents and abilities their gifts and abilities and so he gives this first servant the most gifted and talented one five bags of gold and then he calls in his second most gifted and talented servant and he gives him Two bags of gold. I mean, he's still pretty gifted, still pretty talented. Not maybe as gifted and talented as the other guy, but two bags of gold. I mean, how many of you would like some bags of gold? Obviously, yes. And then he calls in the third servant, and this is the servant that we would say, you know, is the least talented and gifted. And he's given one bag of gold. He's given one bag of gold. And he basically tells his servants, I'm going on a trip. I don't know when I'll be back, but 
but when I come back, we'll settle accounts. And so he leaves. He leaves. And the most gifted and talented servants immediately, you know, right after the master pulls out of town, they take their bags of gold and they start to put their money to work. They start to take what the master has entrusted to them and they start to use it in ways that will increase the wealth, that will add to the bags of gold. What exactly they did, we don't know. But immediately, I mean, as soon as he left town, they start putting that money to work and they want to do something spectacular with it. Whenever the master returns, they want to be able to give him more than they had when he left. They want to, to be able to give him a return on his investment. I think they believe that the master expects that. that the master wants that. They have faith in the master. And, then the, and they trust the master. And they also believe and understand and realize the master has put faith and trust in them. Giving them this money. And they want to do something with it. Now of course... Putting the master's money to work comes at great risk. Let's be honest about that. There is risk there. I mean, to put money to work in order to earn more money means you risk the money that you have. Do you understand that? To put that money to work in order to, to spur a good investment means that they are putting what they've been given at risk. And the more money you want to make, the riskier it is. I mean, that's just the truth. I mean, the more you hope to gain, the greater chance you have to lose what you have. To lose it all. But the most gifted and talented servant, he takes his five bags of gold, he works hard, and he, he doubles his money. So that when the master ultimately returns, he has ten bags of of gold. I mean, he doubled his money. That is a great investment. It had to be risky. He had to put that money at great risk in order to double his investment. But he did it, and he doubled his investment. That's amazing. That's awesome. Five bags of gold turned into ten bags of gold. And then the second most gifted and talented servant. He takes those two bags of gold and he goes to work and he risks it and he is, you know, faithful and he works hard and he doubles the investment. He goes from two bags of gold to four bags of gold. And that's great. I mean, to double your investment, you have to take risks. You have to work hard. You have to take some chances and ultimately to be successful. And he is. He is. But then there's that third servant, you know what I'm talking about? The one who is the least talented and the least gifted. And he takes a much different approach, you know, rather than, than, than running to put that money to work. Rather than, than putting his faith and trust in the master and doing what he could to, to you know, double his investment. Not even just double it. I don't know if that was their goal. Just do something positive with it to, to, to end up with more when the master returns than he had when he, was left, than when he, had when he left. But this guy takes a much different approach. As soon as the master pulls out of town, this guy takes that bag of gold and he goes off to a remote place and he digs a deep hole and he buries it and he covers it up so that it will be safe. I mean, a much, much different approach. And after a long, long time, the master finally returns. And it's time for him to you know, settle the accounts with his servant. And so he calls in the most gifted and talented servant. You know, the five bag of gold servant. And the five, you know, bag of gold servant comes in before his master. <laughs> and, he, and he says, See, master, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained you five more. And he lays ten bags of gold. Down at the master's feet. And the master looks at him. And the master says, Well done, 
good, faithful servants. You have been faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come, come and share in your master's happiness. And, and then he calls in the second most talented and gifted servant. You know, the two bag of gold servant. He calls him in. And it's a very similar story. I mean, this guy comes in and he's gone from two bags of gold to four bags of gold. And so he says, Master. You've entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained you two more. And he lays four bags of gold down at the master's feet. And the master looks at him. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will put you over many things. Come, come share in your master's happiness. And then that third servant is called before the master. And he walks in with, with a dirty money bag, right? Because it's been buried for months. And he approaches his master. He says, master, I knew you were a hard man. I, I know, at least I think I know, that you, you know, gather seed where you haven't planted it. That, that, that you sow crops that aren't yours. I knew you were a hard man. I knew you were a difficult man. And so I took what you gave me and I buried it in the ground. Here is your bag. And the master, the master says this, you wicked, lazy servants, you wicked, lazy servant. So you thought you knew I harvested, you know, where I didn't plant, that I gathered seed that wasn't mine. You thought that was who I am. You thought that was what I did. If you thought that. If you thought that, then why didn't you at least take this bag of gold down to the bankers and put that money with them so that at least it would have gained some interest in the time that I was away? <laughs> why wouldn't you do at least that much? And then the master gives orders. He says, take that bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten. And throw him outside into the darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. He is worthless. Wow. Wow. Now, there's a lot. There's a lot going on in this parable. And we're going to do our best to break it down together and take away the big takeaways for us. And for starters, I think it needs to start here. Let's realize that God invests in the lives of everyone. Let me say that again. God invests in the lives of everyone. Everyone. Regardless of your race. Regardless of your gender. Regardless of where you live, what country you call home, regardless of your socioeconomic status, regardless of any of the things that our world uses to kind of divide us and measure us and, and to cause division among us, regardless of, of any of those things, everyone, everyone. Is someone that God has invested in. Everyone is someone that God has invested in. He is the creator. We are the created. What we have, whatever we have, is a gift from Him. Whatever we have, however much or however little, it is a gift. From him, he has given it to us. We need to know that. We need to understand that. We've all been made 
in the image of God, in his likeness. That he has given us gifts and talents and abilities, and he makes regular investments in our lives. That's who he is, that's what he does. And hopefully, through the gifts and talents that he's given us and the abilities that he's given us and the investments that he makes in our lives, if we will use those, then hopefully we will reach our God-given potential and become the people that we were created to be. There is not a single person in this world who is devoid of all talent and abilities. Not a one. There is not one single person that walks this earth, that breathes air, whose heart is beating, that is devoid of all talent and all abilities. There just isn't. And we should never treat people that way. Do you understand me? We should never treat people like they have no gifts, like they have no talents, like they have no abilities, because they do. God's given them gifts and talents and abilities. And yet it's equally true that we all have different gifts and abilities. And we know this, right? I mean, my gifts and abilities are different than your gifts and abilities. None of us are the same. Our world is different and diverse because guess what? People are different and diverse. I'm not like you. You're not like me. And we're not supposed to be. We're not supposed to be the same. There are talents that you probably have that that I wish I had. And maybe I have a talent or two that you wish you had. That's just how it is. That's, That's life because all of us have been given gifts and talents, but we've all been given different gifts and talents, different gifts, talents, and abilities. It's supposed to be that way. And then there's another truth that, that I'll tell you, it's just as true, but this one is more difficult to accept. I think all of us can kind of accept that we've been given different, you know, talents and abilities. We might not like that. We might wish we had, you know, could trade our talents and abilities, but we understand that. We know that. We can, we can wrap our heads around, but what I'm about to say, it's going to offend some of you. I'm just going to be honest with you with you in advance. It's going to offend some of you, but it's still just as true. We all have different ability and talent levels. Let me say that again. We all have different ability and talent levels. If you're not quite tracking with me, I'm going to be brutally honest here. I'm going to be brutally honest. There are people that are more gifted and talented in this world than you are. And I don't say that to hurt your your feelings. I don't say that to upset you. I don't say that even to offend you. I'm just telling you the truth. There are people in this world who are more gifted and more talented and have greater abilities than you do. That is just the truth. And you know what? It's also true. That there are people in this world who are less gifted, who are less talented, and who have lesser abilities than you do. That is absolutely true, too. Because we have all been given gifts and talents by God. God has invested in all of our lives, every single person. And yet, the gifts and talents and investments are different. They're at different levels. And we just need to understand that. In this parable, we also see that how we view the master will impact our actions. Our view of the master, who we think the master is, will impact the actions of our lives. You see, the master in this parable undoubtedly represents God. God is the master. More specifically, it's probably representative of Jesus. Jesus is the master. 
And it's kind of ironic. He's telling this parable and giving them a preview of coming attractions because, you know, the master going away and then coming back is very reminiscent of when Jesus will ultimately ascend into heaven after his resurrection and then promise that one day he will return. And when he returns, he, he, will, he will welcome us into eternity. And so we have this, this master representing God, or more specifically, Jesus. We have the most gifted and talented servants. We have their view of the master is very positive. They view the master in good light. They think well of the master. They have put trust and confidence and faith in the master. They enjoy the master. They have seen the gifts that the master has given them. And these bags of gold very specifically as things that have been entrusted to them to use well. And they want to use it well. And they just view the master in a very favorable light. They put their faith and trust in him. They believe that he is good. They believe that he desires them to do something positive with what he has entrusted to them. And they're willing to even take risks in order to do more for the master. And they realize when they take that money and they immediately put it to work using you know, their gifts and talents, which ironically the master has also given them because the master is God and their gifts and talents are gifts from him. They put their gifts and talents to work with the investment that he has made and given to them to do something amazing with it. And they're ready. They're ready to do something special. Because they have a favorable view of the master. And so they go out and, and they take risks and they put their faith and trust in the master and his plan and his goodness. And, and they, they go ahead and they, they double the investments. And when they bring that, that money to the master, I mean, what's the response? He compliments them. Well done, good and faithful servants. He gives them more. He says, you've been faithful in a few things. See, I will put you in charge of many things. And then he throws a party and, and encourages them to celebrate with him. Come, share in the master's happiness. I mean, that's, that's the response they get. But the least talented servant. Kind of a different story. The least talented servant. He viewed the master completely differently. He didn't view the master favorably. He didn't view the master as good. He thought the master was evil. He thought the master was bad. He was convinced that this master, you know, kind of harvested where he didn't plant. That he was a hard man, that he was a difficult man, that he would take advantage of people, that he had questionable morality. I mean, he thinks these very bad, negative things about the master. And so what does he do when the master gives him this bag of gold? He just digs a hole and buries it and wants to give it right back to him as soon as he returns. And we know the master doesn't respond well to that. I mean, this servant thought so little of the master that he did nothing, absolutely nothing, other than dig a hole and bury the bag of gold. That's how little he thought of the master, that he wasn't willing to put any effort, any, you know, real work into doing something with what was entrusted to him. He just wanted to make sure he had it to give back whenever the master returns. And so because he viewed the master as evil, because he viewed the master as bad, because he viewed the master as unimportant, he does nothing. And the master says, you wicked, lazy servant. And then he throws him out. Takes his bag of gold and throws him out. Because the actions of his life showed exactly what he thought of the master, which wasn't much. He thought he was evil. He thought he was hard. He thought he was difficult. He thought he was unnecessary and unimportant. See, if, 
If you truly view Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I mean, Savior, the one who saves you from your sins, but Lord, the boss, if you truly view Jesus in this way, then you will take whatever he has invested in your life and you will devote yourself to doing something positive with it because you know one day he's coming back again and you want, you want because he is good, because he has been so good to you, because he has given you something and put faith and trust in you, you want to put your faith and trust back in him and do something special with it so that when he comes back again, you have more to give him than you started with when he left. You want to do something greater for the kingdom by the time he returns. But if you view, if you view the the master, if you view God as evil, as bad, as unnecessary, as not important, then guess what? You will do nothing. And you will just waste. Whatever it is God has given you, you will just waste it. Until one day he shows back up again. That's the truth. Because how you view the master is going to determine the actions of your life is going to impact the actions of your life. And here's what it all comes down to. God desires faithfulness. He wants us to be faithful to him and faithfully use the talents and the gifts and the abilities and the investments that he has made in us. I mean, did you notice that the first two servants, the, the most successful, the most talented, the, most, the, the servants with the most ability... They got the same reward. Did you notice that? They got the same reward. Now, if God actually desired the best outcome, like our world seems to always desire the best outcome, which is the most, right? If God actually valued things the way the world valued things, then the servant who brought 10 bags of gold would have gotten so much more from the master, the one who brought him four bags of gold. I mean, there's a six bag of gold difference there. I mean, if the master wanted to be fair in our worldly standards, he would have honored the ten bag of gold servant to a far greater degree than the four bag of gold servant. Yes, they both doubled their investment, but one has six more bags of gold. As you see, the master... The master wasn't impressed by the number of bags of gold they acquired. The master was actually impressed by their level of faithfulness. Were they willing to put their faith and trust in the master? And were they willing to take the faith and trust the master put in them and take chances and work hard and do something with what they had been given? Or would they choose something different? And it was because of their faithfulness. They both received a great reward. It's not because of the bags of gold. It's because of their faithfulness. And likewise, the one bag of gold servant, the least talented one, the one with the least abilities, guess what? He is not judged harshly because he only had one bag of gold. The servant is not judged harshly because he has one bag of gold. He is judged harshly because he did nothing with what he had been given. That's why he's judged harshly. He had no faith in his master. And apparently no fear really in him either. If he was afraid of the master, he would have at least taken that money and put it on deposit with the banker so he'd give him at least a little bit more back. He has no faith in him. He has no fear of him. He just doesn't even care about the master. He thinks he's hard. He thinks he's difficult. He thinks he's, he, he's evil. He thinks he's not worth even thinking about. And because of that, he does nothing. He didn't care enough or fear his master enough to do anything except dig a hole and bury a bag of gold. So that he could bring it back to his master one day. And see, the truth of this parable, it couldn't be more clear. Faith in Jesus leads to a fruitful life. A fruitful life that will ultimately end in eternity with him in heaven. But a lack of faith 
in Jesus will lead to a fruitless life that will ultimately end separated from God for all eternity in hell. That's that's what it all comes down to in the end. Whenever the end comes, that's what it's going to come down to. And so will you, will you acknowledge the investment that God has made in you? He has made an investment. All the gifts and talents and abilities you have have been given to you by him. Do other people have different gifts? Yes. Do other people have better gifts or use their gifts better than you do? Absolutely. But you have some gifts. You have some talents. You have some abilities. God has made an investment in you. Will you recognize it? How will you choose to view God? Will you view Jesus as Lord and Savior? Or will you view him as bad or evil or unnecessary? Because how you view the master will direct the actions of your life. And when Jesus returns, whenever he returns, because we don't know when, when Jesus returns, will he find you faithful? Because that's what matters. It's not the number of bags of gold. It's what those bags of gold represent. And it's faithfulness. Or a lack thereof. When Jesus returns, will he find you faithful? I know times are tough right now. Things are hard. But every... (laughs) You might be struggling right now. But trust me, God has given you gifts and talents and abilities. And he wants you to use them right now in whatever ways you can to be faithful. And when he comes again, you will receive your reward. But if you think he's evil, if you think he's unnecessary, if you want to waste the gifts and talents and investments that he has made in you, he's still coming back again. And when he does, one day you will stand before him and you will have to answer for that. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you today. We thank you for the gifts and talents and investments that you have made in us. God, help us to remember that how we view you will direct the actions of our lives. If we view you favorably, if we trust Jesus as Lord and Savior, then the actions of our lives will lead us to do something with what you have given us. If we don't, if we see you as evil, if we see you as bad, if we see you as unnecessary, then we will just waste what you have given us. God, help us to remember that you operate differently than this world does. You desire faithfulness over just more. More money, more power, more prestige. You want want more, you want more only of faith. More faithfulness. Because that is what you desire. And that is what you reward. And you will reward eternally those that are faithful to you with life forever with you in heaven. And those who lack faith, they will spend ultimately eternity without you. Help us to never forget that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. If you're here this morning, we're about to to sing a song. And I know you can't come forward in this building, but if God is moving in your heart to get right with him, to embrace him as Lord and Savior, I want you to email me, david at glenviewchristian.org. If you need to rededicate your life to God, maybe you've given it to him in the past, but you know you need to, to get right with him, email me. Let's talk about it. Let's pray together. Or, or maybe, maybe you just... Realize that you you don't want to waste what God has given you. And you just realize that the takeaway for you today is simply to do more with what God has already invested in you. To be faithful so that whenever he comes, and trust me, he's coming, maybe someday soon. When he comes, you want to make sure that he finds you faithful. Let's sing right now, and if God is leading you to make a decision, I pray that you would.